Good evening and welcome to this Be of Head Home q and I'm Anna Bogutska and I'm absolutely beside myself to be hosting this conversation with the writer and director of Titan, Julia de Curnow. Um, so Julia, first of all, I mean, massive, massive congratulations. I haven't stopped thinking about Titan since I saw it. Um, and I wanted to to kind of begin our, our Q&A with going back a little bit between Raw and Tatan and asking you how did the how did the success of Raw affect the life cycle of Tatan? Like how um, how did you feel after that film was finished and you you could start writing the next one? Okay, well, it impacted it massively, <laughs> uh, even more than I could have expected. To be honest, um, the thing is that I spent a lot of time with Raw because um, so basically the release of the film was a year after Cannes. So in between, and I did a lot of, of the festival circuit and then you get the release a year later and after the release, you get the whole um, award ceremony circuit. So all in all, after I finished the film, I had actually two years of touring with Raw and um, it was very tiring, but I was like super happy to do this with my first feature. Um, and I was so happy to see that my film was living uh, very well in other countries than mine. Uh, however, after that, I got like massively tired and going to the next one um, had become very difficult, very, very difficult. So I wrote the first draft of Titan uh, right after that, because I thought, yeah, let's go back to work now and uh, let's move on. And it so happened that I could not move on. It was impossible. And so I started having this uh, massive writer's block after the first draft which was like a very long, um, puffy first draft. It was one, 190 pages, virtually unreadable. Um, and even for me, I didn't know how to tackle that. And so for after that, for a year, I was unable to write. And I was really unable to write like in the sense like I did not take any holidays or whatever. I was just like waking up, taking a shower, getting dressed, going in front of my computer and waiting for something to happen until night comes. And that was a real nightmare, honestly. <laughs> that was really horrible. But I think that this was one because I was very afraid of the outside expectations that were my second feature. And but I think like more crippling was actually my own expectations that was my second feature. And I was afraid that basically I was not going to be able to love my second feature as much as I loved Raw. And, and I did everything for Raw, and I wondered if I could do the same for another feature. So that was something that was very um, difficult to battle for the, for the year. And I mean, on and on, I think that I started getting angry at myself and at Raw. And I, because Raw was taking way too much space in my life and was not allowing me to move on to another feature. And now when I think about that in retrospect, I really believe that that was absolutely ne necessary for me to go through that in order to make a movie like Titan, because I do believe that the radicality that you find in Titan is really stems from um, the fact that at one point I had to say fuck off to everything, including myself and my own expectations, and just write something. <laughs> you, know? you think that 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 anger almost at your own at your own first film and and all of the expectations that come with that is partially the anger that Alexia carries with her as well at, at everything. Well, yeah, I think like partly, maybe. I think for me, honestly, like the anger I had at, at um, this crippling feeling that I had towards my, um, my first feature, um, you can see it more in the, in the structure of Titan mm -hmm. because I really decided to go for something that was um, very organic, very, um, let's say, um, um, instinctive almost. And that I got rid, with that anger, I got rid of the three act structure. Mm -hmm. I, I really went against every academic reflex that I could, could have had uh, when I was writing. So I think it's more visible in, uh, in that because the anger in Alexia's character stems from somewhere, somewhere else, which, re which is really like my, um, um, at one point I questioned, my capacity to relate to my, my own character. And 
virtually I could not. I mean, at the beginning of the film, it's pretty much impossible to relate to her uh, in, let's say, in an, an academic way, like more Morally speaking, it's impossible. But I still needed, uh, I needed, um, you know, an entry point to her in, in order to be able to write her. And that entry entry point was anger for sure, uh, but more like anger as far as um, her condition is concerned, being a woman dancing in a car show and being objectified constantly. And it made me reflect upon my own experience in the public space as a woman uh, with all the strategies that go to it. And that definitely prove us that we are not equal between men and women as far as the public space is concerned. Like we don't apprehend it the same way for sure. And it's definitely not a place of safety for women. And I think that this being so, um, yeah, revolting when you come to this uh, conclusion that this, form of equality, will it ever be transcended uh, um, inequality? Will it, will it be transcended? I'm not sure. So, um, and so I think that stems more from that, from the idea that I wanted my character somehow to not be the designated victim that we all are in the public space, you know, and to kind of um, a return, like reverse, sorry, the, 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 the situation. Um, but again, I insist on the fact that it's not because um, she's better than us. I mean, the, the reason why she retaliates so hard is not because she's better than us. It's just because that she, she can't feel the fear because she has this part of her that is mechanical, that is cold, you know, and metallic. And it means that she can't feel the moment where you freeze, you know, in a situation of assault. And, and that's why she can actually retaliate. Yeah, and, and there's so many things I want to pick up on that you mentioned, and I want to start with the car show, with the real introduction of an adult Alexia. And it's so it's so interesting to hear you compare that to your own experience, I guess, publicizing Raw and, you know, being in public and, and doing all these interviews and Q&As and, and constantly having to, to, I guess, justify the film in some way. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you use the camera and the space in that scene? Because it's it fits into visuals that we're very used to seeing in cinema and music videos and then it shifts visually very very clearly to being something very very different so you're talking about the warner in the car show right yes okay um so this warner um i thought i i did a warner because i wanted us to feel the evolution uh of of our take on the character, um, our take on her. Like at the beginning, I tried to mimic a male gaze basically that goes through uh, in between cars and women the same way, that just navigates between cars and women like they're pretty much the same object, you know? And you follow her from behind. And at this moment, she's not really uh, incarnated. It's like you haven't projected anything in her yet because the movie has just started. And so she's just this guide through this objectivization, objectification, sorry, of, um, of women around her. And then when you get to her at the end of the one, not the end, like a half of the one, -er, then you see her dancing. Um, and this very like revealing clothes, like lots of makeup on, like she looks like perfect cliche of what uh, men would expect from women dancers in this particular context. Yet the thing is that she won it, through her choreography and the way she moves with the car. And I always say with, it's not around the car or next to the car or on the car, it's really with the car. Um, she expresses her desire very clearly it's really all about her desire and no longer about your desire as an audience and the second thing is that i asked her to look through the camera many times and because she's looking through the camera for me she is clearly re reclaiming the narrative she's being active it's not you that is looking at her it's her that is looking at you and that's how i'm trying to uh, reverse this male gaze and to yeah transcend it somehow you mentioned before that there's something that Alexia just cannot feel because she's part mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, and I want, and you know, 
not just the name of the film, but the way the very early descriptions of it as well were just a definition of of what the metal is. Can you talk about the significance of this metal? Why why did that particular um, material draw you in and, and tie so closely with Alexia? Um, well, the first thing is that I, I chose titanium uh, titan uh, because it's, it's so strong, and knowing that. I've always had the last scene of the film in my head. It was, mm -hmm. I almost, almost started with it and did a 180 backward move towards the beginning in order to reach that moment in the room at the end with this birth. And obviously thinking about trying to reach the possibility of a new humanity, of a humanity that is um, monstrous sure but also stronger because it's monstrous and not in spite of it but really because of it like it's an asset and not a flaw anymore not something that is an abnormality or anything mainly also because it is looked at uh, by vincent with love and with acceptance um i had to choose a metal that was incredibly strong and titan obviously titanium sorry is very known for that and that's why it's used in prosthetics most of the time um, and so for me, that choice was like clear from the beginning for that reason, like it's something that embodies strength. Um, the other thing is that I think at the beginning, at least for her, it's really, again, it's, it shows for me that through that car accident at the beginning, something like changed in her and somehow she lost a part of her humanity. Like, She's not completely um, human anymore in the sense that for me, I see metal at the, at, the, at the beginning again, because there is a transformation of metal in the film, but at the beginning, it's really a material that is just dead. It's, it's cold, it doesn't move, it's dead, as opposed to flesh, obviously. Um, and so for me, it's really, it's really a, like, let's say a very visual way to, uh, to show a character that is not, not quite uh, like us, that is not, not quite human, or at mm -hmm. least that is actually um, um, maybe like that, that rejects that humanity in mm -hmm. her. It, it, it leaves like an empty space in her, in her mind somehow. And, um, and so that's why, but I was saying that indeed uh, metal itself undergoes a transformation throughout the film because you start with this plague that again is pretty dead when you see it in the surgery at the beginning when it's being put in her head mm -hmm. um, and at the end you end up on that baby and you see that the metal is moving in the baby you know that it's actually very alive and again for me that is something that that makes sense it's like going from something that is seen as a monstrosity but at the end this from this monstrosity emerges life and emerges hope you know so that was important for me to see like the difference between different parts of the metal in the film. And, and kind of while Alexia is metal and titanium, we've got Van San, who's very much associated with fire in the film mm -hmm. and, and is such uh, a, a broken, very, very motion heavy man. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of his character and how you worked on that with, with Van San Van Dong? Uh, well, First things, first things first, like, yeah, you're right to see that there is this very, very strong relationship between metal and fire in the film. Mm -hmm. This is something that was there from the start, because from the start was this um, um, Greek myth that I, I, uh, I explored a lot for the film, which is um, the mating of Gaia and Uranus in order to um, give birth to the, the Titans and Titanites. Mm -hmm. um, which is obviously um, like something that I try to um, um, adapt in the story of Titan. And, and so for me, it was very clear that um, Gaia represents uh, Earth and uh, he represents um, the sky, Uranus. So for me, it was important to have this very like foundational material at the basis mm -hmm. of, um, of my film being metal and fire and to make them meet, you know? And actually like, at the beginning, you also like have it, um, you have a lot of, um, um, let's say, uh, anticipation of fire in Alexia's world through mm -hmm. the car, which is like, has a lot of fire on the hood. Yeah. 
and the fact that she sets her own parents on fire. Uh, <laughs> but then and, uh, walks away. Well, there is, you know, this very common, um, let's say, interpretation of what fires means, especially in the myth that it is something that is supposed to purify, you mm -hmm. know, um, in myth or in the Bible, in all the founding, founding texts, it's very present. So here, I think at this level of Alexia's world, this is what it means, I think, at this moment. But afterwards, it means something else. You know, there is something uh, for me that is um, more, let's say, um, um, more concrete, less, less abstract. There is really something about heat, about desire, you know, something that is a bit more pagan than that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so this thing is was well on point, as you said, between metal and fire. But, and also by the way, the, the fire can make the metal melt, which is also something that is very interesting, especially when you think about her being in touch with her humanity for the first time and discovering feelings like basically um, the, the, this very like this um, very cold cocoon that she's in that she hides behind can melt because of the fire coming from Vincent's world. And um, and so Vincent's character, I always like to, to say that for me, he he's the opposite of a white knight in shining armor. But the, the, this is one actually one of the first thing I told Vincent Landon, Vincent mm -hmm. Landon, when we started working, I told him, listen, don't imagine that this character is trying to save anybody. He's not. He's incredibly selfish. He's kind of mad because she's really trying to um, somehow um, give birth to his fantasy of finding his lost son again through anyone that he meets and it falls on Alexia because she she pretends to be that son obviously but he just like jumps into that occasion and and somehow tries to um um yeah to give birth to to his own fantasy so for me all this starts with despair for sure and selfishness very much um, that for me also is a form of violence because he really uh, tries to sculpt her appearance when he shapes her, her head, when he puts the metal implant on her nose and all that. And there is something that she put, he gives her like fireman clothes. He's really trying to shape her in a very, for me, intrusive and overbearing way. So that was like a part of the character that is very dark and that it took me a long time to... Uh, have Vincent accept that in his character. And I always told him, listen, your character has a very ascending arc, you know, but if you want to get to the end, if you want to get to that person whose mind is so open and so, his heart is so full with love that he, he is ready to accept that person as that person is and nothing, and you know, no, nothing else, then you have got to start pretty low. You know, otherwise it will stagnate and that's not interesting. And, and that's when actually I think he got it about the darkness of his character. Um, so yeah, so for me at the beginning, one of the references actually for his character was um, James Stewart in Vertigo, who does the same with, mm -hmm. yeah, who does yes. the same with uh, Madeline and Judy. You know, and it, mm -hmm. it, it was a big reference to me when I was writing and when I talked to Vincent as well. Um, after that, I mean, it's really like, it's really a, somehow, um, how do you call this? Un pas de deux, you know, mm -hmm. in ballet, we say un pas de deux uh, in between. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you see that dance is very important for me and in, the, <laughs> in that particular film. Um, and so it, it, it's just really how they, um, by just being together, even if it starts with violence, it starts with resistance, it starts with something that is absolutely unnatural because it's built on lies, how this pas de deux is gonna evolve towards something that is um, need, that they need each other because all in all, they are both of them incredibly lonely and mm -hmm. that they actually need each other to survive. And that's where love can actually take um, its part. Um, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> and, and also one of the things that they kind of have in common, even if they don't know it, is that they, they come from families that are, that are broken in different ways. Alexia destroys hers, 
and Van Sant's family has been decimated by this tragedy, by the disappearance of his son. Yeah. We meet his wife briefly, and she has so much tenderness for him, but also it's is held back by him not being able to move on. Um, and then finally, when they collide, they sort of form a a, a strange yeah. new mythological yeah. family. Can Absolutely. you talk a little bit about what how you wanted to to approach these these visuals and these ideas of family, especially because we don't really see we don't really get that backstory that excuses Alexia's behavior. We just see glimpses of the coldness of her family. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did not want to psychologize anything as far as Alexia's violence is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, I, for me, really, my stake was um, to make her scary, honestly. Like, we take her seriously as someone who can really harm you. And um, I do believe that most of the time in films, um, or TV show or whatever, uh, there is always a tendency to psychologize or justify women's violence. Like it's actually unacceptable. And it's funny when you see all, all the films we see where you have like uh, violence uh, portrayed by men, like shooting each other or you name it, you know, I mean, it's everywhere. And, and somehow we feel that that's more natural. And I think it's sad for everybody, <laughs> honestly. I mean, at one point, I'm sorry, violence is something that's part of our humanity and mm. it's something we need to accept and that is in everybody in us. Um, and so, um, and so, yeah, I try to not psychologize, not justify it because for that reason, because I don't think you can genderize violence somehow. And, um, and so the thing is that the only glimpse I give you from her biological family is that's the, actually the most violent part of the film for me, as far as I'm concerned, is the fact that she's not being looked at by her parents. She's ignored by her parents. And especially her father, of course, I put the focus on him, obviously, to draw a comparison with Vincent. Again, doesn't mean that Vincent is the savior in this, just means that they have different neuroses. But... <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I think like the biggest violence is the fact that she's not being looked at, even though she's really like seeking for that look throughout mm -hmm. like her in her childhood, but also in her um, in her uh, adult days as well. And and I think that's the reason, by the way, that she doesn't have any contour at all at the beginning of the film. Like she she's like completely. Um, um, let's say only drawn by her impulses. She doesn't have contour, she, she's not channeled. She's not a channeled individual. And so she, everything is overflowing, flowing very chaotically out of her. Um, and I think that's not to excuse but I, or anything, but I do think that there is something to do with that. And I think that is definitely someone who is looking for that look. And she's going to find that look with Vincent, but it's a look that is, again, a lie. It's false because he's looking at his son. He's not looking at her. So again, it's going to be how to deconstruct that look to find a way for her to find her, uh, um, a reality in that, um, in the look that is actually non-binary in the end you know, um, on her, where she can find like a way to exist an identity there. Um, and so the idea of, 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 um, of the biological family and the newfound family, it's not really like a lot of people tell me, yeah, but does it mean that you only believe in elected, um, you know, family bonds? I, I don't actually, it's not that, it's, I, it's not like at this level, it's not as specific as that. I do believe that choice, election, make us free, mm -hmm. you know? And that's for me a way to express that, you know? It doesn't mean that I think all, all biological families are dysfunctional or if they are, because like most of them are, let's not kid ourselves. If they are, then it's not necessarily the source of all evil. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not what I'm saying. But I'm just saying that I think when we're talking about an emanc emancipating arc of character, mm -hmm. Election is a very important thing in there. It's just something that makes you free, you know? And for me, it's really the moment where she comes back to Vincent after going away and going to that bus scene and she mm. decides to go back. It's not like she's being held in anymore. It's really like her choice. And for me, like it's a major step for the character to really get 
a step closer to herself, you know, because she makes a, a real choice. You know. And Julie, I'm, I'm conscious that we're running out of time and I just wanted to, to ask you one final question. Um, I found that I didn't know what to expect going into Titan and I found the ending so moving. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience will probably be still reeling for a long time after watching it. And I wanted to ask you kind of what has been the most moving experience for you in seeing people react to the film? Uh, oh, well, <laughs> honestly, I'm very blessed to say that there has been there have been a few. Um, I'm very I'm very lucky that I got to witness. Um, yeah, quite a few. Like I, I had like young women coming and trying to hug me crying, saying that they feel less alone is something that moved me very much because personally, when I make movies, especially considering the kind of movies that I do, I am very often think about trying to find that person who is gonna feel they can relate so much to my film that they don't feel alone anymore. And that sometimes it, some, somehow it, um, um, helps them get rid a bit of, of, of a shame or anger or something like this. And it can catharsize all that, you know? And um, I'm, ha I'm happy when I witness it, every time I witness it, um, especially when you have young women who says that it's empowering and all that, and, 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 and that they actually um, are very in touch with um, um, a non-binary way of thinking things, of thinking people, of thinking genders, um, and of thinking the world, actually. And I think that somehow it's really, um, let's say, um, well spread in, in the younger generation. I mean, between 20 and 30, I'm always mesmerized. I love talking with them um, because they are very, very advanced. Uh, I think in the way they, they see um, the world, they're like, they're, there is so much more gray zone. It's so, so much more open. Um, I, I really enjoy that. And also once there was someone who told me some, something very nice. I thought mm -hmm. it was the best compliment um, someone can do. It's, they told me, it's not someone I knew. Mm -hmm. They told me I cried a lot at the end, but I'm not sure why. And this is something that made me think, oh, okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> because I do think for me, I believe that at the end, I, I don't think you cry um, on the, let's say the conclusion to any of my character's arcs. I think you cry because of a certain idea of humanity that I showed you. And what we lack, what we miss, where we're wrong, where we're vulnerable, when we're tired, and where we could go, and what we could share, you know, and how we could be much closer. And I, yeah, I like, I like this idea that you cry for our humanity and not for my characters. <laughs> it left me shaking. And Julia, thank you so much. I know we need to wrap up, but I just want to say once again, thank you for making Titan and for giving us a little bit of your time today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. Titan is out in UK cinemas from the 26th of December and will be running at BFI South Bank. So if you haven't yet, do make sure to catch it there.